Because if you think about it, if logic is all about having right reasons for your beliefs, that's supposed to be the central theme in education. What's the one class that's not taught in just about any public education system? Logic. Yeah. That's interesting, isn't it? There are two enemies of rationality, two intellectual sins that we must avoid at all costs. They are arbitrariness and inconsistency. Arbitrariness and inconsistency. When it comes to good reasoning, you should have good reasons, and they should not be arbitrary. Arbitrary means not based on reason or evidence. So if you have a belief and you don't have a particular reason for it, it's arbitrary. Now certain things, there's certain things where you're allowed to be arbitrary, but not when it comes to beliefs. Your, your preference in food or in your favorite color, you're, you can be arbitrary there. And so if you wear a red shirt or a blue shirt, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, but that's because that's not a belief. If you believe something, you ought to have a reason for it. It shouldn't be, oh, I believe this, but I don't really have any good reason for it. Right? To have arbitrary beliefs is by definition irrational because rational means based on facts or reason. So by definition, arbitrariness in beliefs is irrational. It's not logical. A rational person has a good reason for his or her beliefs. Beliefs with no good reasons are necessarily irrational by definition. Now children, little children tend to be irrational, don't they? Right? Little children, they believe that there's a monster in the closet. They don't have a good reason for believing that there's a monster in the closet. But they act on that belief. They pull the sheets up over their head to protect them from the monster in the closet. And apparently it works because they're still alive the next morning. Right? That's not good reasoning. Now we expect that from little children. But as you grow up, you're supposed to learn to be rational. And since logic is not taught in just about any of the public school system, and since most of us have been through the public school system, that's the one thing we haven't been taught. And so now we have a lot of adults in this world that act like children in their thinking. And that's not good. That's not good. We have a lot of adults these days, you've seen it, I'm sure, where they, instead of thinking, they emote, right? That's the common thing because, well, they've been taught in their school system that your feelings, that's what's important, your feelings matter. When they should have been taught, your feelings are utterly irrelevant. It's truth that matters. And if your feelings disagree with truth, you need to adjust your feelings. And maybe the world would be quite a bit different now than the way it is. But in any case, we're supposed to become rational with time. That's the whole point of education. Why avoid arbitrariness in our thinking? Because if a belief's arbitrary, there's literally no good reason to believe it. And if you think about it, if you just pick a belief at random, you're more likely to be wrong than right because there are more false beliefs than true beliefs. Right? If you say 2 plus 2 equals, and you say, I'm just going to pick a number at random. If it's anything other than 4, you're going to be wrong. And so that's why it's bad to have arbitrariness in your thinking. You need to have good reasons for your beliefs. The point of a rational argument is to show that we have good reasons to believe the conclusion, and therefore you should too. That's the point of debate, right? So to be arbitrary is to be irrational, and we do have a moral obligation to be rational. We'll come back to that a little bit later. But the point is, if you want to have true beliefs, and, and you should, then you need to avoid arbitrariness. You need to have good reasons for those beliefs. So, and then we need to avoid inconsistency as well. Inconsistent is containing incompatible elements, having parts that disagree with each other. And so things that are contradictory, for example. Uh, inconsistent beliefs are necessarily false due to the law of non-contradiction, which says you can't have A and not A at the same time and in the same sense. Or if you will, the combination of A and not A is always false. Because if A is true, then not A is false and vice versa. So if you have inconsistency in your thinking, your thinking is wrong. And so you need to give some thought to that and work that out and drop beliefs that are inconsistent with other beliefs. So, and this stems from the law of non-contradiction, which is rooted in the nature of God. God doesn't deny himself, and that's why truth will never deny truth. It's, it's truth is self-consistent because God is. So, why avoid inconsistency in our thinking? Because when you have two inconsistent beliefs, at least one of them is false, necessarily. So, if you want to have correct beliefs, you need to drop those that are inconsistent with each other. Inconsistent thinking is contrary to the nature of God. We're supposed to emulate God's character... God is self-consistent, therefore we should be self-consistent as well. And it's explicitly unbiblical. And let me just take a look at a few of these verses. For example, uh, 2 Corinthians 1.18. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. 
The Apostle Paul is saying we don't contradict ourselves. Why? He gives the reason, because God's faithful. Faithfulness is a kind of consistency. When God says something, he's going to do something, and he does it, that's faithfulness, and that's consistent. His words match his actions, and that should be the case with us as well. We should have consistency in our thinking. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer a word. They say, You can't have two almighty gods. Right? It's impossible. Uh, if God's God, worship him. If Baal's God, worship him. Don't try to worship both, which is what they were trying to do. That was an inconsistency that he was exposing and pointing out that doesn't make any sense. Hypocrisy is a type of inconsistency where your actions don't match your words. And Jesus did not have nice things to say about hypocrites, right? Matthew 15, you hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So they say one thing, their lips say one thing, their heart, which represents the core of their being, is, is different. That's a problem. In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the precepts of men. So they, they claim to bow down and worship me, but then they teach men's doctrines rather than God's doctrines. That's inconsistent, and Jesus was not pleased with that. So, every Christian should strive to be rational for three reasons. There's probably many more, but three that I'm going to give. First of all, we do have a moral obligation to be rational. It's sin to use your mind improperly. Okay, it is. Rationality has many practical benefits. Learn to use your mind properly. That will benefit you in many ways. There's really probably no aspect of your life that won't be improved by using your mind properly. And then third, it's essential in apologetics and the defense of the faith. You will come up against people that, that will mock the Bible and try to disprove it. And if you know something about logic, it's a lot easier to deal with, it, with that situation. So let's start with the first. We do have a moral obligation to be rational. Let me show you this from the scriptures. Because first of all, God is rational. He is truth. His mind defines truth. And so his thinking is always correct and self-consistent. So he's rational. And we're made in his image and are commanded to emulate his character in as much as is possible on a creaturely level. We can't be exactly like God, but we can emulate his character. And we're supposed to do that. Ephesians 5.1, we're to be imitators of God. The Bible says, come now, let us reason together. The Bible's not anti-reasoning. It's very pro-reasoning. We just need to base our thinking on God's word and reason from that. We don't do what many people do today and treat God's word as a mere hypothesis to be evaluated by our allegedly superior intellect. That is not right. Okay. No, God's word is the basis for truth, and that's why he gave it to us, so we could think properly. And we're supposed to reason from the scriptures. There's, the scriptures themselves teach that. And when we don't, God has a problem with that. It says, for my people are foolish, they know me not, they are stupid children and have no understanding. It's interesting that God here is condemning stupidity, foolishness, and indicating that that goes along with wickedness, evil, foolish, stupid. They go together. Now, God gave different people different amounts of intellect, but whatever he's given us, we need to use it for his glory, obviously. And to fail to do so is sin. It really is. I think it's interesting that God equates stupidity and evil here. It is, it is evil to be stupid. And it is stupid to be evil. Okay? Those go together. And it is wise and right to think in a way that's consistent with God's character. Isaiah 55 is one of my favorite passages in Scripture. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So verse 8 is giving you the problem. The problem is you don't think like God. That's what God's saying. You, you're not, your thoughts are not like mine. Your ways are not like mine. That's a problem. He's giving the solution first in verse 7. The solution, you turn away from your thinking and line it up with God's. You turn away from your actions and line them up with God's. And if you do that, God will forgive you. Okay? So I think that's uh, powerful. We need to learn to think in a way that's consistent with God's character. And if we don't, it's sin. If, if our thoughts are not God's thoughts, that's sinful. Now, lest we in our arrogance say, well, yeah, I know your thoughts are different from mine, God, but maybe you should change. Then he gives us verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's thinking is superior, and we need to strive to line up our thinking with his. 
And then some people say, but wait a minute, if God's thinking is that superior to ours, as the heavens are higher than the earth, and as an astronomer, I can assure you, that is an enormous difference. It really is. How can we ever think like God? Well, obviously, we can't think exactly like God. He's infinite. We're finite. His thinking's beyond time. We can't even comprehend what that would be like. But we can think in a way that's consistent with his nature. The way I always think of this passage, I think of this um, distant source of light, like a quasar or something, very powerful source of light out in space that I could never reach, and it's shining down on the earth, maybe like a spotlight, right? I could never reach that light, but I can stand in the beam, and then I can see what's going on around me. In God's light, I have light, you see. That's a biblical principle. So that's the way we think like God. We think in a way that's consistent with his character, knowing that we can never think in an infinite way like our, like our Lord does. The Bible tells us we're not to be as the horse or the, as the mule, which have no understanding. They're not designed to be intelligent in the, way that, in the way that we are. It says, whose trappings include bid and bridle to hold them in check, otherwise they will not come near to you. So you see, you know, you want to make a horse go that way, you put this little bit in its mouth and you steer it that way and that's the way it'll go. You want to make it go the other way, it'll go that way. God says, don't you be like that. Somebody says, you need to do this. Says, okay, I'll do that. You need to do that. Okay, I'll do that. No, you're supposed to think. You're supposed to think and not be like the horse or mule. We're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. A lot of apologists like to use the first part of that verse as their theme, and it's perfectly fine. We're destroying speculations, every lofty thing, every argument raised up against God. That's a good thing. We should do that. The second part's the key to achieving the first. We're to take every thought captive to obedience to Christ. And that is a difficult thing to do because of our sin nature. Do you have any runaway thoughts, any thoughts that are not captive to obedience to Christ? If you do, they're not good for you, and you need to relinquish them. That's a lifelong process, I understand. But that's, that's the goal, is to think in a way that's consistent with the character of God, to have the mind of Christ. That's the goal. So since we're commanded to pattern our thoughts after God, and we've seen the verses, to fail to be rational is sin. So it's a sin that God can forgive, but it, it is something that out of gratitude for salvation, we ought to get our thinking as right as we can in a, in a, so as to glorify God and to show our gratitude for his salvation. And we'll fall short in this lifetime, no, no doubt about that. But that's something that we all need to aim for. So we do have a moral obligation to be rational. Secondly, rational, rationality has many practical benefits. Learning to use your mind rightly, it's going to benefit you in this world. And I just, there's probably an infinite number of benefits, but a few that I thought of. First of all, it makes you more likely to believe things that are true, right? I mean, that's the point of it. We, we can't know everything, but we, if we reason properly, we're more likely to have true beliefs than false beliefs. Again, we don't have all the information necessary to make all the decisions, but we have some information. And if you reason rightly from that, you're, you're going to be more likely to do better than, than otherwise. And then true beliefs, of course, affect better decisions. If you believe things that are true, your behavior will tend to follow that. There was the old um, advent the, the Adventures of Superman show back in, it was started out in black and white, so it was many decades ago. And there was a little cape that you could buy with it for your kid. And, and many kids would put on that cape and they'd jump off the <laughs> roof. And that didn't end well for them. There were some injuries. And they had, to, uh, they had to deal with that in one episode where Superman says, now only Superman can do the things that Superman can do. But those children were not thinking rationally. They thought that by putting on that cape, they could fly like Superman. That was not rational and ended up causing them pain. And so obviously thinking better leads to better decisions and you're gonna have less pain in your life if you, if you think rightly about things and behave on that. Uh, thinking ra uh, rationally reduces our susceptibility to sophisms and other errors. These, um, there are certain types of arguments that tend to fool people and, you know, you, you might think of a, a lawyer using those. Maybe he's not supposed to, but he might anyway. Um, and they work unless you're familiar with them. And then they don't work. And so if you are familiar with logical fallacies, especially those that, that tend to be very persuasive, these tricks that people use to manipulate you, if you're familiar with them, 
you won't be fooled by them. That's a good thing. A lot of the nonsense that's happened in the last few years could have been avoided if people were thinking rightly. Enough said there. Thinking rationally helps us in matters of science to judge between competing models. I mean, I find this very useful as a scientist because we don't always, we, don't, we never have all the information. And so we, we take the information that we have and we try to draw logical conclusions from that. Sometimes we disagree. And so it's helpful for me to see two, when, when there's two people who disagree on, on some fact of, of science and they can't decide you know, who's right, it's helpful for me to see their arguments and to see how they're drawing that conclusion. And a lot of times, if there's a debate between the two, it very quickly becomes obvious who's got the better case. Not always, but sometimes. It can also help you to distinguish between genuine science and pseudoscience. And this is a big problem these days, because there's a lot of things that are alleged to be scientific that aren't, in the sense that they haven't been discovered by application of the scientific method. They haven't been demonstrated by repeatable analysis and so on. They're just asserted to be scientific, or they use scientific language to describe them. Evolution would be one example of that, Darwinian evolution. It's not science, but they use scientific jargon, and it makes it sound very credible. But if you know something about logic, you can say, well, what experiments have you done to demonstrate this? Oh, none. Okay, well, there you go. Thinking rationally, according to scripture, will bring increased knowledge, wisdom, happiness, and blessings. Yeah, you can read the Proverbs there. It, Having wisdom, learning to use your mind properly, brings these, these blessings to us, and that's, that's a great thing. Thinking rationally will greatly aid our evangelism and our call to make disciples of all nations. If you're thinking rightly, that's going to help you to articulate the gospel well and to defend the gospel well when there are objections against it. So that's a very uh, good reason to learn how to use your mind rightly to the glory of God. Thinking rationally is critical to a proper understanding of Scripture. Yeah, we're supposed to use our mind when we read the scriptures and think about them and build our theology on them. We're supposed to do that. And it can help us avoid heresy. Heresies always involve a mistake in reasoning. They do. And I thought I'd give you one example of this just so you can see how this works. Because I got to tell you, my theology has improved since studying in-depth logic. Because you, you just start to see things that you didn't see before. And you think, well, no, that can't be right, because that's inconsistent with this. And, and uh, let me give you one example of this, um, a scripture that's sometimes misused. John 5, 28 through 29, Jesus is speaking. He says, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good, the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. And a lot of people look at that verse and they'll say, well, there you go. Good deeds apparently lead to resurrection of life, eternal life. And evil deeds, a resurrection of judgment. So that's where you get the people who say, well, see, if you're a good person, you go to heaven. If you're a bad person, you go to hell. And that's a fallacy because that's not exactly what Jesus said. There is a correlation between good deeds and a resurrection to life and evil deeds and a resurrection to judgment. But one, you got to be careful because this, this, by saying, well, good deeds, therefore, are the cause of salvation is a fallacy. It's called the cum hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy. That's the Latin name for it. All fallacies have these fancy Latin names. You don't have to know the Latin. It's a fallacy of false cause, if you want so it's sort of the English name for it. The, that Latin phrase means with this, therefore, because of this. And so basically the, the fallacy is saying A and B go together. Therefore, A is the cause of B. Good deeds and a resurrection to life, salvation, go together. Therefore, good deeds are the cause of salvation? Well, we know they're not, right? So that's, that's a fallacy. Um, there is a correlation between the two. It's not that good deeds cause salvation. It's salvation that causes good deeds. If you're saved, you want to please the Lord. And so you, you do good works out of gratitude for salvation. And the Bible very clearly teaches that. Those who are saved will want to obey. They'll want to keep God's commandments. That's the, kind of the whole point of the book of 1 John, really. So there is a correlation between the two, but it's not, that, it's not A that causes B. It's B that causes A in this case. Okay? So Jesus was perfectly accurate in what he said. It's just you, people don't always draw the right conclusion because they're not thinking logically. They've confused correlation with causation in this case. So that's just one example of a heresy that you could avoid 
by knowing something about logic. So that's certainly a practical benefit. And then third, rationality really is essential in apologetics and the defense of the Christian faith. And that's something we all need to do. And it's, it's very helpful in, in two different ways that I want to cover today. And I want to spend some time on this because I think it's important. First of all, arguments against the Bible are always inherently fallacious. The Bible is true, and so if somebody comes up with an argument against it, you can bet that argument has an error in it. It has to. They're arguing against God, the source of truth. That's not going to work out well. But if you know something about logic, it's easier to spot the error. And then secondly, rationality actually presupposes the Christian worldview. That's interesting. Logic is predicated upon what the Bible says in order to justify it. I'll come back to that one. That's a little abstract. But I want to start with this first one, that arguments against the Bible always contain a fallacy in them. They either start from a false premise or they have a fallacy, an error in the chain of reasoning. And so, uh, it, it, and if you know something about logic, it's easy to spot these. So if somebody comes along and says, why are you creationists against science? I've heard people make that statement. And that is a fallacy. That is called the fallacy of the complex question. That's where you phrase a question such that it assumes an unwarranted conclusion. In this case, they're concluding that creationists are against science. And this is always a little amusing to me because I did spend quite a number of years to get a PhD in astrophysics. I don't exactly hate science, right? I mean, <laughs> so it's called a complex question because it should be divided into two. First of all, are you against science? And then secondly, if so, then why? But when you combine it together like that, it already assumes the answer to the first question incorrectly, I might add. And so in, in a court of law, you're not allowed to do that. Sometimes a lawyer might try to get away with it, but the opposing counsel, if he's worth his salt, will say objection. That's a com complex or compound question. And uh, so, yeah, so that's a problem. Somebody says, either you believe the Bible or you accept the scientific method. Well, I, I certainly accept the scientific method, and I believe the Bible, right? So they've given me two options, and neither of them is the correct option. C, none of the above, right? Because I, I believe the Bible, and because I believe the Bible, I believe in the scientific method. Or I believe that it's, a, it's not infallible, but the, I mean, the Bible's infallible. The scientific method is a useful tool that the Lord's given us to test certain truth, truth claims. And not all, by the way. Not everything can be tested that way. So this is a bifurcation fallacy, bifurcation fallacy, the either or fallacy, either this or that, when in fact there's a third option. Life is not a multiple choice test. If somebody said A, A or B, you can always say C, none of the above, right? We can, we can write in that third option, that's fine. So that's an example of bifurcation, either this or that, when in fact uh, they can, in this case, they're both true, or there's a third option, okay? So somebody says, the Bible teaches that God causes lightning and rain, but we now understand that these are due to natural forces. Therefore, the Bible's wrong. That's a bifurcation fallacy. Either God causes lightning and rain or natural forces do. Both natural forces are the name we give to the way that God causes lightning and rain. Okay? Natural laws are not a replacement for God's power. They are God's power. And the fact that we can write down equations describing them tells us something about how God thinks. He's very mathematical in his thinking and precise. And if he, he weren't, we, we would have no hope in being able to describe the universe or predict eclipses like the annular eclipse that's happening today. So, so that's not, it's, it's not A or B, it's I, I, both. Natural forces are the name that we give to the way God upholds his universe. So does God hold atoms together or do electromagnetic forces hold together? Well, both. Electromagnetic forces are the name we give to the way God holds his atoms together. So it's just we now understand some of the details of how God upholds his creation. And not all of them, by the way. We're still learning. Somebody says, we know evolution's a fact because bacteria have evolved resistance to antibiotics. This is an example of an equivocation fallacy. That's where you change the meaning of a word in the middle of an argument. See, evolution has more than one meaning. They're trying to prove evolution in the neo-Darwinian sense of common descent, the idea that all uh, creatures on Earth are descended from a common ancestor biologically, which I would reject. 
By then, but then they're trying to prove that by showing an example of change in a generic sense, bacteria do sometimes become resistant to antibiotics, and we know the mechanism by which that happens. There's a few, actually. And so that's, but one, one kind of change doesn't prove another kind of change, does it? So you, gotta, you, might, you might ask a person to clarify, what do you mean by evolution? Neo-Darwinian evolution, or do you mean change within a kind? Because we all believe change within a kind, right? So when someone says, I know evolution in the neo-Darwinian sense is true because we see evolution in the sense of generic change happening, that's, a, that's an error in reasoning. One kind of change doesn't prove the other kind of change. So that's an equivocation fallacy, very common one. Someone says, creationists do not believe that animals change at all. That is a straw man fallacy. That is where you misrepresent your opponent and then show how easy it is to knock down that false representation. So the straw man fallacy, misrepresenting your opponent's position. Is it ethical? No. Does it happen? Yeah. It happens quite a bit. And not just among evolutionists. Creationists sometimes do this as well. They'll misrepresent their opponent. And we, we shouldn't do that. It's not right. But it's very common for evolutionists to misrepresent creationists and put words in our mouth that we do not believe and then show how easy it is to to refute that position. But he might, he might not do as well if he were put in the ring with an actual creationist in terms of what we actually believe. That might be harder for him to refute. I think it would be. Somebody says, well, you're just a Christian because you were raised in a Christian home. Now, that's a, that's a tricky one. It's not true of everybody. There are a lot of Christians who were not raised in Christian homes, and they become Christian later. But um, I do fall into the spin. I was raised in a Christian home, so what, how am I supposed to answer that? The tricky thing about this one is there's some truth to it. But what people fail to recognize is it's irrelevant to the truth of Christianity. This is a distraction from the issue. This is called a circumstantial ad hominem fallacy. Ad hominem means to the man. You can't, if you can't refute someone's argument, you try to refute the person. In this case, uh, dodging the argument by pointing to the person's circumstances or motivations for making that argument. Okay? And so, um, well, you're just a Christian because you were raised in a Christian home. That certainly helped, and I'm grateful for that. I'm very grateful for that, right? But that doesn't mean I don't have great reasons to continue to be a Christian. It's irrelevant. How I came to be a Christian is irrelevant to the truth of Christianity. Those are two separate issues. You see how a lot of fallacies are distracting. There's a whole group, fallacies of relevance, that, dis that attempts to distract from the issue at hand, the truth or falsehood of a particular claim. So, and just to illustrate this, the person who makes this claim, you're just a Christian because you were raised in a Christian home, would be like somebody saying, well, you just believe in the multiplication table because you were taught it in school. Like, well, yeah, I mean, if I'd been raised by wolves, I probably never would have discovered the multiplication table. That is true. But that doesn't make the multiplication table false. I've got some really good reasons to continue to believe in the multiplication table, right? So the, our circumstances or motivations for believing something are irrelevant to the truth of it. Somebody says creationists are not real scientists. You say, and, and that's often as a uh, retort. Somebody says, well, you know, there's no, there's no scientists that believe in creation. Somebody says, well, Dr. Lyle's a scientist. He believes in creation. Well, no real scientists believe in creation. And that's called the no true Scotsman fallacy. That's what it is. And that's where you protect a position from rebuttal by incorrectly redefining terms. And it gets its name from one of the uh, early examples of it. Somebody says, uh, no Scotsman puts sugar on his porridge. Somebody says, well, Angus is a Scotsman. He puts sugar on his porridge. Then the response is, well, no, true Scotsman puts sugar on his porridge. But the problem is there's nothing in the dictionary definition of a Scotsman that says anything about whether or not you put sugar on your porridge. Okay? So that's what makes it a no true Scotsman fallacy. It's reversible, too. I could say, well, no, no real scientist believes in evolution. But that would be just as false, wouldn't it? We need to be honest. I would only do that for the sake of hypothesis to show that it doesn't have any, it doesn't have any real power. Somebody says, our department is becoming infested with creationists. I heard somebody make that claim one time, and it stuck with me. Because, I mean, what, what that's designed to do there is to invoke an emotional reaction by using infested, like rats. Creationists are like rats. They're just everywhere, and they're disgusting, and so on. 
This is a question-begging epithet. Question-begging epithets where you use biased or emotionally charged language in place of logic to persuade. And you'll see this all the time in politics. You'll see this all the time on the internet. A lot of internet exchanges on creation versus evolution are nothing but a series of question-begging epithets. And I'm sorry to say that creationists sometimes do that as well. It's not just on the evolutionist side. You think we ought to do better, but sometimes we don't. So there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with uh, occasionally using emotionally loaded language. There's a place for that. But it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be as a substitution for rational reasoning or for a good argument, right? So we want to be persuasive in what we say, but we, we shouldn't do it in such a way that it's void of rational argumentation. So, how about this phrase, evolution versus creationism? That's really subtle, but it's interesting. I see this quite a bit. Evolution versus creationism. The, it's the ism that makes it a problem. Because you add ism to something, that's, well, it's a belief, right? So this is subtly trying to tell you that evolution, that's the way it is, that's a fact. But creation, that's just a belief without making any argument for that at all. So that's another example of a question-begging epithet. It's using biased language to try and persuade you of something that is logically unproved. So we've got to be careful about that one. So there it is. So those are just some examples. Um, I would argue that all arguments against the Bible are always inherently fallacious. Have I proved that? No. I've given you some examples. But the interesting thing is, rationality itself presupposes the Christian worldview. And if I can demonstrate that, then that would prove that all arguments against the Bible are fallacious because logic is rooted in the character of God as revealed in the Bible. Okay? If the Bible's true, then any argument against it would have to contain an error, wouldn't it? Either it start from a false premise or it would have to have a logical fallacy. So rationality presupposes the Christian worldview. What do I mean by that? Consider the laws of logic. Laws of logic are the rules that govern all correct reasoning. And there are a number of them. Um, but a lot of people are familiar with the law of non-contradiction, which says you can't have A and not A at the same time and in the same sense. If I said my car's in the parking lot, and it's not the case that my car's in the parking lot, none of you hopefully would rush out to see a car that's there and not there. You'd say, well, no, that you're mistaken or you're lying, but you're, we know that can't be the case. You can't have a car that's there and not there at the same time and in the same sense, right? So that's a law of logic. And they govern all correct reasoning. So whenever you reason, even if you can't recite any laws of logic, they're kind of built into you. Now, you can learn them better by taking a class on logic, and that's great. But they're kind of built in because God knew we would need them to survive. But what are they? What are these laws? Are they, are they something you can touch? No, you can't. They're abstract, right? You can't touch a law of logic or pull one out of the refrigerator and eat it. You can say, I got indigestion because I accidentally swallowed the law of non-contradiction. So they're abstract. They're not tangible. They're not made of atoms. They're abstract in nature. They exist in the world of thought. Laws of logic exist in your mind. They're universal. That means they apply everywhere, right? And so when you go to a new city that you've never been in before, you think, boy, I hope laws of logic work here. You assume that they work there, don't you? You assume that they work everywhere, and everybody does. Astronomers assume that laws of logic work in the Andromeda galaxy, but they've not been there to check. That's interesting. They assume that they work all the place. When the, when the astronauts first went to the moon in 69, uh, that was an amazing program. And there's a lot of things that could have gone wrong because that was an engineering marvel, really. It's just amazing what they did. And they had lots, those astronauts had lots of concerns. Lots of things could have gone wrong with that mission. But one of the things the astronauts were not worried about, boy, we hope laws of logic work on the moon. Otherwise, we might die and not die. Right? <laughs> they weren't worried about that. They were worried about other things, but not that. We assume that laws of logic are universal. We assume that they're invariant, that they don't change with time. Right? I mean, you assumed, presumably, that laws of logic would work today. 
I mean, well, they worked yesterday. Yes, they did, but how do you know they'll work today? Oh, that's interesting. We just assume that they'll work in the future. But they won't, you know, and, and nobody says, well, yeah, laws of logic work on Saturdays, but not on Thursdays. On Thursdays, contradictions can be true. No, we, we somehow know better, don't we? We know that laws of logic work at all locations and at all times. They are invariant. They don't change with time. They, it's not like they've evolved either. It's not like the law of non-contradiction used to be a law of contradiction where you, know, you had to contradict yourself. They were in two contradictory statements are both true, but then it evolved. No, it's always been the law of non-contradiction. It's invariant, and they're exceptionless. It's not like laws of logic work most of the time, but every now and then, two contradictory statements can both be true. No, no. They work at all times, They're, and, and they have no exceptions. These, these properties of laws of logic make sense when you understand that laws of logic are reflections of the way God thinks. Laws of logic are reflections of the way God thinks. That's why they're abstract, because God's thoughts are abstract, because all thoughts are abstract, right? So that makes sense. Um, the laws of logic can exist in your mind, but only if God has given them to you. God, and he has. He's God's revealed himself. He's given some truth to us in various ways, not the least of which is his, his word, of course. They would be universal because God is omnipresent. He's sovereign over the entire universe. And so, of course, laws of logic will work in the Andromeda galaxy because God's mind is upholding the Andromeda galaxy. Of course, they'll be invariant because God doesn't change. God is beyond time. Right? I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed, the Bible says. God doesn't change, therefore his thinking will not change, therefore laws of logic which reflect his thinking will not change. And they're exceptionless because God is sovereign over all truth. You realize there's no truth that exists outside the mind of God. Everything that's true is known to God and is within his mind and is something that he thinks and therefore something that we should think as well. So these make sense in the Christian worldview, but not in any other worldview. Certainly not in the atheistic worldview, where all you have is matter and energy. You can't even have laws of logic if all you have is matter and energy, because laws of logic are not made of matter and energy. They're conceptual. But in the, in the secular worldview, how do you have that? The, see, the weird thing is, laws of logic worked even before human beings were around, right? For a few days, in my view and the secular view for million, billions of years. How, what, how did they work? You know, if they're abstract, if they're conceptual, that means they need a mind in order to exist. But there, in, in the secular worldview, there were no minds before people. That's interesting. You got a problem. See, I can have minds before people because the mind of God exists before human beings, right? So I can have that. Secularists believe that laws of logic are universal, but how do they know that? Have they been everywhere in the universe to check? No, most of them have never even left the planet. Right? How do they know they'll work in the future? And they'll say, well, they worked in the past. I say, I'll grant you that. How do you know they work in the future? Well, well they've always, they always have. I grant you that. But therefore, they always will? That, I, by that logic, I could argue that I'm immortal. After all, I've never died before. Right? That's not, lo that's not logical. How do you know they're exceptionless? Have you checked? Well, we've never seen any exceptions. I've never seen Antarctica. Does that mean it doesn't exist? Huh. It's interesting, isn't it, that secularists will assume that laws of logic are abstract, universal, invariant, and exceptionless, rules of reasoning, yet they have no basis for that on their professed worldview. Those are Christian conceptions. Those things only make sense if you believe in the biblical God as described in the Bible. Somebody says, well, could some other God make sense of those? No, because some other God hasn't revealed himself. It's the biblical God who has revealed his nature to us in the Bible, you see. So laws of logic, they stem from the nature of God. Consider the law of non-contradiction. Can't have A and not A at the same time in the same sense. That makes sense because God doesn't deny himself. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Yes, there are some things God cannot do. When you talk about God being all-powerful, we mean he can do anything he wants to do. There's some things he wouldn't want to do because they're contrary to his nature. And that includes denying himself. So God can't deny himself, and all truth is in God, right? All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ. So if all truth is in God, and if God can't deny himself, that means truth can't deny itself. It can't, two contradictory statements can't both be true.
That's where we get the law of non-contradiction. It stems from God's nature. All laws of logic stem from the nature of God. The way he thinks. They reflect the way he thinks. So, when unbelievers use laws of logic, they are stealing from the Christian worldview. They really are. Consider naturalism, the belief that nature is all that there is. Everything that exists is matter and energy. And naturalists will try to use logic to persuade you of their position. But logic isn't made of matter and energy. See, the naturalist attempts to use logic to convince others of his position, but he can't have logic in his worldview because it's not made of matter and energy. Secularists will stand on Christian presuppositions because they have to in order to argue against the Christian worldview. That's a problem. They're, now, they're not going to admit that. They're going to say, oh no, laws of logic, those, are, those aren't Christian presuppositions. But then I'm going to ask, then how can you make sense of their existence and their properties and how you know about their properties? How do you know they're universal? How do you know they're invariant? Because you're assuming that. Well, I guess I don't know. Well, I guess you're irrational, aren't you? Right? Because, again, we've talked about being arbitrary. That's not rational. Somebody says, well, I just believe that, they, that laws of logic are universal. Do you have a reason for that? No? Then you're irrational. Secularists are presuppositional kleptomaniacs. They're constantly stealing from the Christian worldview to support their own. They can't help it. And they're built that way by God. And it really shows that they're made in God's image and that they do know God in their heart of hearts, but they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. Oh, I've read that somewhere before. That's in Romans 1. Yeah, the Bible teaches that. You can think of a debate over laws of logic like a debate on the existence of air or the, a debate on the existence of God like a debate on the existence of air because the critic of air would have to use air to make a case against air. Wouldn't that be strange, somebody arguing there's no such thing as air all the while breathing and expecting that we can hear his argument as the sound is transmitted through the air? That would be so strange. Obviously, in order for the critic to make the argument, he would have to be wrong, right? It's the same way with those who argue against the biblical God. They have to use logic to argue their position, but logic is, stems from the mind of God. It reflects his thinking. In order for them to make their argument, their argument would have to be wrong. And if you realize that, boy, is that powerful. Every argument against the Bible has to presuppose logic, which is a biblical concept. You could never justify logic apart from the Christian worldview because you'd never know that it's universal and invariant and that it's, it governs all correct reasoning, that there are no exceptions. You could never know those things apart from, the, apart from a God who has revealed them to us. And he knows everything, so we can take his word on that. There's not too many responses to this that I've heard. Some people would say, no, you don't need God to account for laws of logic. Uh, laws of logic, and they're not abstract, they're material, they're the chemical reactions in the brain. Well, if they're chemical reactions in their brain, then, th then they're not laws. Then that means they don't work in the Andromeda galaxy, because nobody's brain is in the Andromeda galaxy. Or on Mars, for that matter. See, the reason that, that brilliant scientists were able to get a helicopter to fly on Mars, which I think is amazing, yeah, they did that, is because laws of logic work on Mars but no one's brain is on Mars. So laws of logic cannot be merely chemical reactions in the brain. And frankly, my chemical reactions in my brain are different from your brain, and so we'd have different laws of logic. Well, that's not true. We all have the same laws of logic. That's, that doesn't work. So they're not chemical reactions in the brain. Somebody says laws of logic are descriptions of how the brain thinks. You don't need God. It's just a description of the way we think. Hmm. This one's a little tricky because it's getting close to the truth because I would argue laws of logic are descriptions of how God thinks. But they're not descriptions of how we think. Otherwise, we could never violate them because you always think the way that you think, right? You could never accuse somebody of violating a law of logic. Say, well, you're not thinking the way you're thinking. Well, of course I'm thinking the way I'm thinking. That's the way I always think. If laws of logic were merely descriptions of how the mind thinks, then why would we need laws of logic to correct the way the mind thinks? They're the standard, and our minds fall short of them often. So that's a problem. Somebody says laws of logic are conventions. A convention is something that we all agree on, and it works, like that there are 12 inches in a foot is a convention, or that you drive on the right side of the road, that's a convention. But of course, 
different cultures have different conventions. You go to Australia, they drive on the left side of the road there, and everybody agrees to that, and that works pretty well. So if laws of logic were conventions, then that means different cultures would have different laws of logic. And say, welcome to Australia. Here, contradictions are true. Here, you have to contradict yourself, right? Well, that would be absurd. They can't be conventional. Somebody says they're just a property of the universe. That's, you know, they're just, they describe the universe. No, they don't describe the universe. They describe correct reasoning. Now, it's true the universe never violates one. And that's another issue that the secularist can't explain. But they're not, they're not describing the universe. And frankly, the universe is changing. It's expanding and stars explode. And so if laws of logic are reflecting a changing universe, we'd expect they would be changing as well, wouldn't they? But they don't. So that doesn't make any sense. One guy I was talking with, he responded this way. He said, well, we use them because they work. So that doesn't answer my question. I'm asking how you can make sense of them, the existence of laws of logic and their properties. I know they work. They work because they reflect God's thinking. But in your worldview, how can you account for their existence? So this is a fallacy of a relevant thesis. He's not answering the question I'm asking. He's just pointing out they work. Nobody disputes that. Yeah, of course they work. If I came in this room and there was a Volkswagen right over here, wow, how did that get there? And somebody says, well, it works. That wasn't my question, right? So again, that's distracting from the issue. So yes, they do work. They work because they're true, and they're true because they reflect God's character. You see, a secular worldview can't make sense of that. A secular worldview has to stand on the Christian worldview to get things like logic, to then argue against the Christian worldview, the very ground on which you must stand to make the argument. So my point is, if any, lo if any logical argument refuted the Christian worldview, then you wouldn't have been able to make the argument in the first place. Because you wouldn't, you'd need laws of logic to make that argument, and laws of logic are rooted in the nature of God. Now, I've never had anybody be able to come up with any alternative to that. It's very powerful. And so once you realize that any argument against Christianity tacitly assumes the truth of Christianity to get off the ground, you realize there can be no good argument against Christianity. That's powerful. So I've been using that approach for many, many years. I've never had anybody be able to come back from it because it's, it's based on God's word. And you want to argue with God? Good luck with that. You'll end up like Job and saying, I opened my mouth when I shouldn't have. I can't contend with the Almighty. So we've seen that we have a moral obligation to be rational. The Bible tells us to be that way. Rationality has many practical benefits. It'll improve your theology. It'll improve your reasoning in, in other areas as well. And then it's essential in apologetics because all arguments against the Bible tacitly presuppose the Bible and because there's always a logical fallacy in arguments against the Bible in any case. So I want to show you some of the resources that we have out front. You probably saw those coming in. Uh, the book that I have that deals with a lot of these things, it's an introduction to logic. Now, I wrote this really for junior high to high school level, but my hope is a lot of adults will pick it up too because most adults have never had a class in logic. And it'd be a great thing to use if you're homeschooling. This is, this is really what I had in mind was homeschoolers when I wrote this. And so there's a teacher's guide as well with, with uh, tests and quizzes and things and an answer key so you can go through that and really learn to, uh, to think logically and to the glory of God. That's another thing that's unique about this book. It's not just teaching you the mechanics of logical reasoning, but it's showing you how they're rooted in the nature of God. And that's what makes this book uh, unique in any of the textbooks that I've seen on logic. So that's why I wrote it. And then with my, uh, with my home church in Colorado Springs, I actually went through this book. We had a Sunday school class. We had 10 sessions, and we recorded those on DVD. So if you're an audiovisual learner, uh, check out our Get Logical series, which is just going through the book, and it's me kind of elaborating on that. If you just want to dip your toe a little bit into the pool of logic, discerning truth, it's just, it's a, you could read it in an afternoon, and it's going to go through the top 10 errors that evolutionists commit when arguing against uh, biblical creation in terms of the logical fallacies that they make. Uh, if you want to learn more about how to defend the faith in general, this is the book that I recommend, The Ultimate Proof of Creation. It's going to give you a bulletproof argument for biblical creation that no one can refute, and we've seen a, a little bit of that. We've seen how logic is, is really tacitly presupposing the biblical God. And this will show you that science does as well, and so does morality. And it's a very powerful, very powerful resource. We have that on DVD as well, Ultimate Proof of Creation. 
And then uh, understanding Genesis, how to rightly interpret the first book of the Bible. It's really how to interpret all the books of the Bible, but with focus on Genesis. And so for those folks who say, does Genesis really mean what it says when God created in six days? Yes, it does. And that's going to show you how to defend that. We have that on DVD as well, showing you the importance of understanding Genesis. Keeping faith in an age of reason answers over 400 alleged Bible contradictions. And you've heard critics say, well, this verse contradicts that one. Uh, well, it doesn't, I checked. But uh, in any case, you now know that when they make that argument, they're assuming the law of non-contradiction is true, but that's rooted in the nature of God. So uh, if the Bible weren't true, they wouldn't be able to argue against it anyway, because there would be no law of non-contradiction. Taking back astronomy, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the next session, how to um, view the universe through biblical glasses. That's a fun, that's a fun resource. And also Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, how to better enjoy the night sky as a Christian. And it's just a fun resource. When's the next meteor shower, things like that. And uh, what you can, if you want to get a telescope, what kind you might want to get and how to use it. Um, if you don't, there's a lot of stuff you can see naked eye. That's fine too. Dinosaurs in the Bible, we'll talk about that in the afternoon session, I believe. And then uh, we do have book packs. We only do this at conferences, the packs at conferences. You can get the individual resources on our website. But uh, we do a book pack, which is 20% discounted. So that's here today and tomorrow only. And then we have a DVD pack as well, 20% discounted for the best of our videos. And then we have our library pack, kind of the best of everything. Not everything we put out's in it, but a lot of what we put out is in it. And so that's a great way to have an immediate creation library at your disposal. We do have some children's resources too, because children get hammered with this. And I didn't write these, but I highly approve of them. They were very well done. The answers book for teens as well as uh, Answers for Kids, Answers Books for Kids, the pack set there, really well done. Very concise, theologically and scientifically accurate answers to the questions that, that kids ask and that, frankly, a lot of adults ask. It's really an adult book disguised as a kid's book. So there you go. And One Blood for Kids, because uh, racism is becoming an issue again. Can you believe that? And that's going to show you that really there's only one race, the human race. And it's going to show you how we get these little genetic differences and things like that. But we're all descended from Adam and Eve, and we all need a savior. We do have a free monthly newsletter. Please sign up for that. And make sure you put your email address because it's an electronic newsletter. If you don't put your email, you will get nothing, OK? So do sign up for that. Not too many things free in this world, just salvation and our newsletter. And then check us out as well uh, on the web, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. We will meet back here in a half an hour. Go buy some books. All right, thanks. God bless.
It's because the universe does declare God's glory, as the Bible teaches in Psalm 19.1. And so I think it's helpful for us to know some of the basics of astronomy and, and how uh, these testify to the truth of the Bible and the creativity of the mind of our Lord, who has made an amazing universe. I mean, if he just made the Earth, the Earth is amazing. But he's made all these other planets and all these, these, these worlds and stars and galaxies, and it really showcases his power and majesty. So what you see here is an overhead depiction of the solar system with the paths of the planets highlighted in green, and the, you can see the planets labeled. Those are the inner four planets of the solar system. And it was, uh, you might notice that they're approximately circles, but they're not exactly circles. Uh, Mars, you can see, is a little bit uh, elliptical, and that's true of all the planets, but uh, Mercury in particular, Mercury's got an elliptical orbit. But you might notice that Mars' orbit is closer to Earth sometimes and farther at other times. So the planets actually orbit in ellipses, which is kind of a squashed circle, with the sun at one focus of the ellipse. An ellipse is defined as the set of all points that are equidistant from two points. And the way you can make an ellipse is if you take a, a piece of string and, and, and tie it to itself to make a, a, a loop, and then you put two thumbtacks in a piece of paper, and you pull the, the string taut and then just go around, it'll make a perfect ellipse. And the, where you put the two thumbtacks, those are called foci. Each one is a focus. And it turns out that planets orbit the sun in ellipses with the sun at one focus. The other focus is empty. And it was a creation scientist who discovered that. His name was Johannes Kepler. And uh, yeah, Kepler was a very devout Christian, very devout. And he was, he, had been, he was training to go into the ministry, actually. And then he recognized that God is also revealed in astronomy and mathematics and felt that it was his passion to declare God's glory in those areas. But he was a very devout uh, Christian and creationist. He was a six-day creationist, like myself. He believed that God created in six days and rested one, as the Bible teaches. Most scientists did at that time. It wasn't until uh, really the 1700s that they started adding the billions of years, which was necessary for Darwin to have any kind of credibility. Not that he does anyway, but that was the reason for it. Anyway, so Kepler discovered that the planets orbit the sun in ellipses. Previous to that, people had thought, well, perfect circles. But then that didn't quite work, so they had circles within circles and so on. And, uh, and, and frankly, at that time, a lot of people still believed that the planets and the sun orbited the Earth. But uh, there's good evidence. We know better today that, that they orbit the sun, including the Earth. So pretty neat. Kepler also discovered the relationship between a planet's orbital period and its distance from the sun. He found that the period in years... Uh, squared is equal to the distance to the sun cubed, where the distance is in Earth units, which we call AU. So the Earth is one AU away from the sun on average. And you'll notice that, indeed, if we speed up time, Mercury orbits a lot quicker than does Venus, does the Earth, and Mars. And it's pretty neat. If you put the orbital period in and square it and then take the cube root, you'll get the, uh, you'll get the distance to the sun. So it's pretty neat. You can convert one way or the other. And it's just exact, and it's wonderful to see that kind of precision, which we would expect from the God who is the author of mathematics, after all. So that's the way the planets look from an overhead view. The outer planets are quite a bit further out. You can see that much further out. People don't appreciate the scale of the solar system. And we really have to speed up time to get the outer planets to move at all. So the inner planets are really whipping around there. And then, uh, yeah, so Jupiter's taken, Jupiter takes like 12 years to orbit the sun. Saturn takes like 30 years to orbit the sun and so on. So pretty amazing. So now a lot of times when you see the solar system, this is kind of an overhead view. We're looking over sort of the North Pole of the solar system. A lot of times you'll see it depicted in a textbook in a, well, you don't usually see it at John, but it is, all the planets are in the, pretty much the same plane, which um, they used to argue that as a design feature, and I think it is because it keeps everything sort of organized. If, if things were in different orbits, they would gravitationally perturb each other and it would be not as stable. But the secularists also have explained this. They say, well, the solar system formed from a collapsing cloud, so they'd expect everything to be in the same plane. So it's one of those explanations that kind of works either way. A lot of times you'll see the solar system depicted from a perspective view like that, where it's kind of somewhat tilted. And some people mistake that for an overhead view, and they think that the planets are really, the orbits are really, they're not that elliptical. They're just a little bit elliptical. So from overhead is where we get a more accurate view. So go back into the inner solar system. 
And there we go. So one of the amazing things is we have now visited each of these planets and many of their moons with spacecraft. I think it's amazing. I feel very blessed to live in the time in which we live, where we've sent spacecraft out. Some of them have landed. We've sent landers, at least for Venus and Mars, that have landed on the surface, and it's just amazing. And so we know in incredible detail what these planets look like up close, because we visited all of them, and that's pretty neat. And so I'm going to show you some of that as we go through and, and talk about these things. This is their current configuration. This is the way the planets look right now. If you could go over our, the north pole of the solar system and look at them. So let's, start, let's dive in and talk about the sun, first of all. And we've sent a number of spacecraft in close orbit to the sun to, to detail that. And frankly, the sun's big, so you don't really have to go there to see it. You can uh, put spacecraft in Earth orbit, and there's one in Earth orbit now that's taking high-resolution images of the sun. So there's the sun. It's basically a, a ball of hydrogen gas. Hydrogen's the lightest element. It's got some helium in it, too, hydrogen and helium. And it's just compressed into a sphere by its own gravity. Yes, gas has its, its own gravity. Everything does. It's just you have to have a lot of it for it to be significant. But you, you in fact, have your own personal gravitational uh, field. And if you were in space, um, I, I did the calculation one time. If you took a hammer and just and you're in space and you let go of it, it would take four hours to fall to you. So you do have your own gravity. It's just uh, you, the Earth has a lot more and the sun has even more. So the sun is about 100 Earths across. That gives you a feel for how big it is. And you say, yeah, but it looks tiny. I can block it with my thumb easily. That's because it's 93 million miles away. So that's, that gives you a feel for that kind of distance. So the sun rotates. You can see it rotating there. And it's fun to watch that. It's got these uh, spots on the surface. We call these sunspots because we're not very creative. And that's what they are. But uh, those are cooler regions on the sun. The sun's surface temperature is normally about 6,000 degrees Celsius, whereas sunspots are a chilly 4,000 degrees Celsius. So they don't, grow, they don't glow as brightly as the rest of the sun. And they're associated with magnetism. Your compass would just go crazy next to those sunspots. So... Pretty amazing. So that's what the sun looks like. And uh, I did my doctoral research um, dealing with the sun using the SOHO spacecraft. So I'm sure you'll all want to read my dissertation later. So we won't. We won't. I'm kidding. We won't want to do that. Are the, yeah, their spots are still hydrogen. Hydrogen and helium. Yep. They're just uh, they're cooler because it's because the magnetic field penetrates there and that causes, that cuts them off from their power source. And so they cool off uh, more rapidly than the rest of the sun. So yeah. Pretty neat. They do. They move. This, yeah, they move around a little bit. They're mainly carried around with rotation, but they do move a little bit here and there. So, yeah. So there's the sun. Puts out more energy in one second than a billion cities could use in an entire year. And it just it reminds us of the unlimited power that God has. And, of course, that's, the sun is one star. I think there's about 100 billion stars in our galaxy and at least 100 billion galaxies in the visible universe, and probably a lot more now that the James Webb is detecting more, so pretty neat. But we have sent spacecraft past each of the planets. We've sent at least a couple past Mercury, the Mariner spacecraft back in the 70s, and then Messenger uh, more recently. That's what Mercury looks like up close. And so this, although this is a computer simulation, it's based on actual images that have been taken by NASA spacecraft, and we rewrapped those onto the sphere so we can rotate it around. And this is what it would look like if you were there. So Mercury is a barren planet. It looks a lot like the moon because it has only a very thin atmosphere, not very substantial at all. It rotates very slowly. It takes about 50, I think it's 53 days for it to rotate once. So it's a slow rotator, which is kind of neat. And be, being so close to the sun, that day side really gets just baked. And so the surface temperature goes up to about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. So that would be rather unpleasant. Uh, the night side drops to like negative 200 degrees because there's no, uh, it's, it's rotating very slowly. So it hasn't seen the sun in, in weeks. And, and it just radiates off that heat into space and therefore gets very, very chilly, which means there is a place on Mercury where the temperature is quite nice. Right? Right? So presumably right about there. <laughs> so if you ever crash land on Mercury, make sure you land right about there. And it turns out it rotates slowly enough that if you landed there just before sunrise and started running west, you could outrun sunrise. 
you have to keep going. You don't dare stop or it carries you around and you burn. But uh, it's kind of neat to see these worlds that have these conditions very different from Earth. So, so there it is. A lot like the moon because anything that comes near it, there, there's just no substantial atmosphere. And so anything that comes close just kind of hits it. And the other thing that's interesting about Mercury, too, is it has a, a strong uh, magnetic field. And that was something that was really surprising to the secularists because magnetic fields should naturally decay with time. They're caused by electrical current in the core, and that current encounters resistance, and it decays gradually. Uh, well, uh, if it was billions of years old, it should be gone by now. And so it still has a fairly decent magnetic field, and that was something that was surprising to the secularists. And there's evidence that it's decayed even between the two spacecraft and the decades between the 70s and I forget when Messenger was sent up, but more recently. And it, um, it, so it's, it's decaying right on schedule. It's just only 6,000 years old, so that's why it's still there. So it's uh, compelling evidence of creation, so that's pretty neat. Mercury's about a third the size of the Earth. It's about three times closer to the sun, so that makes that easy to remember. So there it is. Pretty neat. The planet Mercury. Venus is the next planet out. It's been called Earth's sister planet because it's just about the same size as the Earth, just slightly smaller. But that's where the similarity ends because it's very different from Earth in almost every other respect, other than it's a solid planet. You could land on it. In fact, the Russians have landed a bunch of uh, landers on uh, Venus. And they don't last very long because the surface temperature on Venus is 900 degrees Fahrenheit. It's even hotter than Mercury. And that's because of that thick atmosphere that you see surrounding the planet. In fact, whenever you look at Mercury in a backyard telescope, all you see is the clouds in its atmosphere. You never see really any surface features. So, and, and a lot of uh, secularists thought that Venus might have all kinds of exotic life on its surface, and they were free to speculate unfettered by inconvenient data because of those uh, clouds that completely obscure the surface. And so, of course, that was before they learned the surface temperature is 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So no, you're not going to find uh, life on Venus. But uh, those clouds, when you remove them, we've, we've actually mapped the surface of Venus using radar. The Magellan spacecraft went into orbit around Venus, and radar can penetrate clouds and map the surface. And so we now know that the surface of Venus looks like that. So it is a really tortured planet. And there, there's evidence of past volcanoes on Venus, which is interesting. There's none that are active as far as we know, but that's pretty neat. And Venus rotates very slowly and it rotates backwards. So the sun would rise in the west and set in the east on Venus, although you'd never see it because of those thick clouds. So pretty amazing. It's a strange world. And the backwards rotation of Venus has never really been properly explained by the secularists. In the Christian worldview, we can say God's creative. And so he made a couple planets that rotate backwards. In the secular worldview, it's very hard to account for that because if the, net, if the solar system collapsed from a collapsing cloud, everything really ought to be spinning the same way and upright. And uh, Venus just is exactly the opposite of what the secularists were expecting. So I always find that fun. There you go. So there's Venus. Uh, those clouds, by the way, are made up of sulfuric acid type compounds. So there's just lots of ways to die on Venus. The, uh, the, uh, the atmospheric pressure is like a hundred times that of the Earth, so it would crush you like a tin can. Or it's just a question of which is going to kill you first: the sulfuric acid. You're going to dissolve in acid, or you're going to burn. That'd be pretty quick. Or he's going to crush you like a tin can. Probably that one would kill you quickest. So there you go. So not a place you want to visit on your next vacation. And some people would say, well, why did God make a planet like that with this toxic atmosphere and this? You know, well, you're not supposed to go there. He didn't make it as a vacation spot. He made it to be beautiful, and it is. It's the third brightest object in the sky. You got the sun, moon, Venus. Pretty neat. And you're seeing it right now. You're seeing it in the morning sky for those that are morning risers. It's that really super bright one that you'll see in the east. Yeah, just before sunrise. That's it. And Jupiter's a bit higher up. So there you go. Venus. Earth's sister planet in name only. Okay, so the next planet out, Earth, is my very favorite. <laughs> Has the best restaurants of any planet. All my friends live there. All your friends live there. So, and I feel very privileged that we live in a time where we now have uh, images of the Earth from above. That's pretty neat. Something our uh, ancestors only could have imagined. You see, the couple of, we got a couple of spacecraft that are orbiting it there, Hubble and 
the international. There's a lot more than that, but those two are labeled. I'm going to turn those off. Let's see, because that's annoying. Turn off spacecraft labels. There we go. So, yeah, so that's approximately what the Earth looks like from above, and I think that's pretty neat. A friend of mine is actually an astronaut. He just retired, Jeff Williams, and he spent all kinds of time on the International Space Station. And whenever they have downtime, which they do not have a lot of downtime, um, but the astronauts, uh, when they have downtime, Jeff would like to go. There's a kind of a, a bubble window in the lower section of the, of the space station. He would go there and just photograph the Earth from above, and uh, it's really neat. In fact, I've, we, we did a presentation one time together, and to save time, we put his PowerPoint on my computer. And I'm like, Jeff, I'm keeping your PowerPoint. And he said, that's, that's fine. But uh, it's pretty neat to see the Earth from space. Beautiful. The Earth is unique in many ways. It's because God formed it to be inhabited. Isaiah 45, 18, the Lord formed the Earth to be inhabited. And uh, that's something that is not true for any of the other worlds. They would, they would kill you quickly. Earth, designed for life. So it's got free oxygen in the atmosphere. And that's what you need to breathe, of course. It's got liquid water on its surface. Uh, Two-thirds of the surface, they're actually 70, 71% of the Earth's surface covered with liquid water. So that's pretty neat. It has uh, mountains and valleys and canyons and so on. Geological activity that's caused by internal heat in the Earth. And a lot of those features we think were formed during the worldwide flood. It has plate tectonics. Earth, as far as we know, is the only planet with plate tectonics. Other planets have tectonics, but they don't. they're not divided into plates that can be moved. And we think that's the mechanism that God used to start and to end the worldwide flood, plate tectonics. So we think the continents were connected before the flood and, the, and were pushed apart during the flood. That's a creationist idea. The uh, secularists then caught on and said, well, maybe if we slow it down over billions of years, we can allow that. But uh, we think it happened rapidly during the flood. So anyway, it's just ideally d designed for life. It has that magnetic field. Magnetic fields indicate can't be billions of years old because they decay quickly. And the Earth's magnetic field, if you assume an exponential decay with a half-life of something like 1,200 years, you run it back in time, the Earth's magnetic field would have been 20 times stronger at creation, which was, would have been nice. Increased protection from cosmic radiation, which can cause things like cancer and so on, so we'd have protection from that. Uh, but if you run it back 60,000 years, I did the calculation, the Earth's magnetic field would be so strong, it'd rip the iron out of your blood, and life would not be possible. So that puts a pretty tight constraint on the age of the Earth at much less than 60,000 years. And, uh, of course, we think, no, scripturally, it would be something like 6,000. So that's pretty neat. So beautiful planet. And we have one large natural moon, which we call the moon. Hey, for millennia, this was the only moon known. It wasn't until 1610 that anybody realized other planets can have moons. 1610 was when Galileo first pointed his telescope up at Jupiter and saw three little starlets next to it and eventually four that are Jupiter's moons. And uh, so he knew he was onto something there. Here's what our moon looks like. It looks a lot like Mercury, doesn't it? Now we see the same side of the moon at all times. People think it doesn't rotate. Well, it is rotating, but it rotates at the same rate that it revolves around the Earth. And so it keeps the same face pointed toward the Earth at all times. That's why you always see this side of the moon and those particular features. So pretty neat, but it is rotating. If we were to follow it, from, if we were to watch it from a distant star in space, you could see it rotating. And so you'd eventually see all sides of the moon. It just it keeps one face pointed at the Earth. And eventually you'll see the Earth in the background there. See, there it is. And so, so if you lock that in, you can see it's rotating. It just keeps the same face pointed at the Earth. And I've always thought that would be amazing because there were, there were 12 people who got to walk on the moon and look up and see the Earth and be able to cover it up with their thumb. I think that's pretty neat. That'd be a sight to see. And knowing that everything and everyone that you love is on that little blue gem up there. Just, it's, it just looks so small and so delicate and it makes you realize how awesome God is to uphold that uh, by the word of his power. So there you go. That's the Earth and the Moon system. Let's go back to the Earth. The Moon has what's called remnant magnetism, which is an indication that it can't be billions of years old because magnetism decays with time. And so it, it, it would be gone by now. Let's go to the current time. I wanted to do this. There's the Earth as it is now. Let's do I have a few options. Butter. No, I guess we're good. I guess we're good. Speed up time a little bit. That's what I want you to see. If we speed up time, that little dark shadow there, can you see that? That's the shadow of the moon. 
because we're having an annual eclipse today, right? So where it's darker there in the middle. And so if we let that go on, you can see it. See the shadow of the moon crossing there? So, yeah. So, yeah. So later, after this talk, we'll maybe go out and look at it. I brought some equipment. You can safe, let you safely look at the sun. So there you go. So that's today. Pretty neat. I was very happy to arrange that for you today. There we go. <laughs> Wish I could take credit for that. But no. We'll get a really good eclipse. So the, the, this current eclipse is an annular, which means that um, the moon doesn't completely block the sun because the moon's a little... Moon has an elliptical orbit too. It's a little farther away sometimes. And so right now the disk of the moon is, looks a little smaller than the sun. So even if you were right under the shadow, you would just see a ring of where the, where the sun's still visible. Uh, but in April 8th, I think, April 8th, yeah, next year, we get a total eclipse. And uh, come right through this area, actually. You might have to drive a little bit, but not very far, to get to the center. And uh, that'll completely block the disk of the sun. And then you can see the outer regions, the corona, and it's stunning. I've only seen one total solar eclipse. I am definitely going to go see the one next year. So uh, I make plans to do that because it's neat. That's the only way you can see the corona with, with human eyes is during a total solar eclipse. Very spectacular. And then sometimes you can see, if you have binoculars, you can see the chromosphere, this real thin layer of blood red. It's, it's just a little bit outside the photosphere. It's gorgeous. So anyway, fun to see. So that's the eclipse that's happening today. Pretty neat. So the chromosphere? Yeah. I think so. I think so. Yeah, I definitely saw it with my eyes, but whether we got it on video or not, I can't remember. I think we did. It'll look like a real thin layer of red just surrounding the, the moon there. So, so there's the Earth, and that's a lot of fun, but we want to move on. So the next planet out is Mars, and although Venus has been called Earth's sister planet, Mars is really probably the most Earth-like planet other than size. It's about half the size of the Earth. But otherwise, it has a lot of similarities. It's got valleys and, and canyons. In fact, there's an enormous canyon that you can see just below center there. You see that looks like a large scratch mark right there? That's a Valles Marineris. That's the, um, that's the largest canyon we know of. It's, it would dwarf Earth's Grand Canyon. In fact, it, it would extend about the width of the United States. So it's a massive canyon. It's not a water canyon. We think it's a tectonic fissure where the crust is broken broken open. But there is evidence that Mars had water in the past. We find dried up riverbeds on Mars, even though there's not a drop of liquid water on it today, as far as we know. So it's got canyons, it's got mountains, it's got um, massive mountains, in fact, they're volcanic, and you can see four of them there. You can see three that are in a straight line, this one, this one, this one, and then a really big one right there. That's Olympus Mons, that's the largest known volcano, and it's uh, thought to be extinct, possibly just dormant. But in any case, it's three times taller than Mount Everest, and the base of it would cover the entire state of Iowa. So it's a really big volcano. It's a shield volcano, very shallow sloping, like the main island in Hawaii, for example. So there you go. Because Mars doesn't have plate tectonics, the, uh, the, the volcanoes get bigger there, and the gravity is less on Mars, so the volcanoes can get really big. So there you go. Mars has polar ice caps. It's got a northern polar ice cap that you see there, and a southern one as well. And they grow during the winter and they retract during the summer, just like the polar caps on the Earth. Mars has seasons just like the Earth because it's tilted. T tilting the planet is what causes seasons. And so you get more daylight hours in the summer, fewer in the winter. And so Mars works the same way. The ice is a combination of frozen water and carbon dioxide, dry ice. So carbon dioxide would freeze on, on Mars. So yeah, and you can see some of these features, like this big dark one, which is Sirtis Major. That's a wonderful feature there. You can see that in a small telescope. I've seen it just looking at Mars, and it's uh, really neat. Uh, Earth comes close to Mars every 2.1 years, and we're in between right now. So, so next year is when that will happen, late next year. So pretty neat. Other uh, similarities, it does have an atmosphere. It would have a sky. It would have a blue sky. Occasionally pink because dust gets kicked up. Mars is made up of uh, iron compounds, basically rust. You know how rust has that reddish color? That's the iron in it. That's what gives Mars its color. It's that distinct red color. Uh, so, And named after the god of war because there's blood war, so blood red, that kind of thinking. But then there's some differences too. Mars doesn't have any liquid water on its surface today. 
we think it did in the past, uh, but not today. Again, there's ice at the poles, but that's a combination of uh, water ice and dry ice, carbon dioxide. And big valley, that big valley down there, Hellas, sometimes fills in with fog and looks white. People mistake it for the southern ice cap, the southern ice caps further down. So the atmosphere is real thin carbon dioxide, so you couldn't breathe on Mars. So that would be your biggest problem there. But it would still kill you slower than Venus. Okay, so it's still, it's a little better than Venus. You could at least have a space suit on, on Mars with oxygen and you could walk around a little while before the radiation would eventually get you. Because um, it doesn't have that protective magnetic field that the Earth has. So cosmic radiation would come and that's going to be an issue if they ever put people on Mars. They won't be able to stay there permanently. Um, maybe a year or two and then they'd have to come back to the shelter of the Earth. So Mars has two moons and they are tiny. They're called Phobos and Deimos, which names mean fear and terror. And because uh, God of war is associated with war is associated with fear and terror. There's Deimos. Yeah, not all moons are round, right? It's only a few miles across. It's less than 10 miles across. So you could walk around that moon and it'd be a nice little hike. And the gravity would be very weak too because it's so small. But only large moons are round. Small moons tend to have a random shape because there's not enough gravity to pull them into a spherical shape. So that's Deimos. And then the inner one is Phobos. And you can see these in a small telescope, but you really have to know what you're doing. Because they, it, it's not that they're, they're plenty bright enough, it's just that Mars is 200,000 times brighter. And so it's hard to see something faint against something that bright. You have, there's, there's ways of doing it though. But I've seen both of those moons. So there's Phobos, pretty neat. And it's just a little bigger than Deimos. Again, a little, probably a little more than 10 miles across, depending on which axis you pick. The view of Mars would be spectacular from Phobos. You can imagine looking up in the sky and this is Mars right there. That would be, that would be a weird feeling, I would think. And the gravity on Phobos is so weak, you could pick up a rock and throw it into orbit. You could watch it go down over the horizon and you better duck because it's going to come up and hit you in the back of the head. <laughs> so I think that's pretty neat. You could almost, but not quite, jump off. So it's just weird to think of these situations that we don't have on Earth. So Mars and its two itty bitty little moons, uh, Phobos and Deimos. So really neat planet, a lot of fun to look at in a small telescope. Now these inner four planets that we've looked at, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are called the terrestrial planets, terrestrial meaning Earth-like, in that uh, they're solid. You could, you could land on them theoretically and uh, walk around, except Venus would kill you before you'd land because of the heat. But um, the rest of them are solid and that's different from the outer planets. When we go to the outer solar system, the outer planets, Jupiter and Saturn, for example, are gas giants. They're made of, they don't have a solid surface. They're gas held together by its own gravity. And so let's go out to Jupiter, the innermost of what we call the Jovian planets, meaning Jupiter-like, and Jupiter's the prototype. So there's what it looks like. That's what a ball of gas looks like when you get enough of it. It's made of the same stuff as the sun, hydrogen and helium, and trace amounts of the other elements. And Jupiter's cool enough, the, the sun isn't. The sun can't form molecules because they would break apart, it's too hot. Jupiter's cool enough to form molecules and so you think, get things like ammonia and methane that'll form. And the clouds that you're seeing there, the orange clouds, those are primarily ammonia. But everything you're seeing there is atmosphere because that's what Jupiter is, it's a ball of gas. Probably becomes liquid at some point due to the pressure. But uh, in any case, you can't land on Jupiter, there's nothing to land on. Theoretically, you could go through it, but, um, but the pressure would become very, very intense as you go deeper down. Yeah, yeah, the craft would be buoyant at some point, so it would get stuck at a certain depth, probably. So, that's Jupiter, and it has, it, the clouds always form these, these bands that you see around Jupiter. They're called belts and zones. Belts are dark, zones are light, and the zones are higher up. So the white clouds are higher up than the orange ones. If you'd remove the white clouds, it would just be all orange. And of course, there's that lovely uh, red spot that you see coming around there on the left, uh, which we call the Great Red Spot, because again, we're not very creative. That's an enormous uh, anticyclone. It's a high pressure system, kind of like a hurricane on the Earth. And you could, put, you could fit two Earths right in that, because Jupiter's 10 Earths across. So it's a huge planet. And that red spot has been going for hundreds of years. How does a hurricane last hundreds of years? On Earth, a hurricane is powered by ocean temperature. After a hurricane passes through the ocean, the ocean temperature drops about 10 degrees. But then it moves over the land and it gets cut off from its power source and it 
dies out. Jupiter has no land. So it's very hard to stop a hurricane once you get started on Jupiter. But th there are smaller cyclones and anticyclones, and they will interact with each other, and sometimes they'll get absorbed and so on. So it's fun to watch all these fluids on Jupiter and how they interact with each other. It's quite impressive. So Jupiter has a whopping powerful magnetic field, much stronger than the Earth. And that's an indication that it can't be billions of years old, because magnetic fields decay with time. And so that speaks to the youth of Jupiter, as, as does its internal heat. Jupiter gives off twice as much heat as it receives from the sun. So it gets one unit, gives away two. It gets one unit, gives away two. Kind of like our federal government, right? <laughs> yeah. And like our federal government, it can't do that forever, because eventually it runs out of energy. And so this is an indication that Jupiter is only thousands of years old. If it were billions of years old, it should be an icicle by now. It shouldn't have that internal heat. Uh, not that it's warm, but it's warmer than it should be. The magnetic field is strong enough that you can get aurora on Jupiter, that northern lights, aurora borealis. How about that? We've seen those on Jupiter, so pretty, pretty impressive, I think. So, yeah, Jupiter does have a thin ring system, like Saturn, that was discovered by one of the Voyager spacecraft, or maybe Pioneer. That they, they, and you can only see it when you're, I mean, this is a simulation, of course, but in, the only way you can actually see those rings is to get behind Jupiter and get a photograph from behind, and you can see the sun glinting off of them. But you can't see them from Earth, or at least I, well, maybe we can now. With The technology is just, it's amazing what's, what they can do now. So, so, yeah, that's Jupiter. Yeah, they're probably, uh, Jupiter's rings are probably mostly dust. Saturn's would be a combination of uh, dust and, and actual pebble-sized objects. We're not sure how big they are. So you can see one of Jupiter's moons passing in front of it there. That's its uh, innermost moon, Io or Eo, and uh, the, the innermost of the large moons. And, and that little moon is also casting its shadow on Jupiter. So if you were on Jupiter today and you were under that spot, you get a total solar eclipse. Pretty neat. And then there's another moon that's casting its shadow Further down on Jupiter, that's probably Ganymede casting its shadow there. And you can see those in a small telescope. And it's fun to watch. You can see those little black spots that appear when the moon. It's predictable, of course, because we know the orbital periods of these moons, and so you can predict when their shadow will fall on Jupiter. Or you can look it up on the internet, and, or somebody's done the calculation for you, and you can predict when that'll appear in your telescope. And uh, it's fun to watch that. It takes a, it takes a few hours for it to, to cross in front of Jupiter. We've sped up time quite a bit. But uh, that's fun to, fun to see. So Jupiter was the first planet where we found other moons. And that was discovered in Gal by Galileo in the year 1610. And he wrote this little booklet called The Starry Messenger, which is a fun read. If you've, ne if you've never read The Starry Messenger, I highly recommend it. Because Galileo is very excited about being the first human being to see moons around another planet. He didn't even know what to call them. He called them, he called them planets. It's just their planets that orbit another planet. Because nobody thought about other moons. There was just the moon, right? And so it's fun to, it's fun to, to read his work that he saw through his spyglass. They hadn't used the word, the word telescope. It wasn't used for that at that time. He called them a spyglass. Because that's what you use them for, spying on your neighbor. Nobody thought about pointing it up until Galileo did in 1610. And he writes about all these wonderful things. Craters in the moon. It's the first time anybody had seen craters in the moon and uh, extra stars that you can't see naked eye that he saw in the Pleiades. And it's just his uh, delight as he talks about these three little, initially three little spots and then eventually four that orbit around Jupiter. And he, and he figured out they're orbiting around Jupiter. Because you go out the next night and they've, they've switched places. And you go out the next night and they've switched places. So it's, uh, it's, fun, to, it's fun to see those. And, and you can always see those four moons in a small telescope orbiting Jupiter. In, unless one of them is directly behind Jupiter or directly in front of it, or if Jupiter's casting its shadow on one of the moons, then it, it'll, you can't see it. But otherwise, you can. And it's fun to watch. So Jupiter's just a fun planet. So let's take a look at some of these moons. Let's go to the innermost, Io or Eo. This is something that Galileo wouldn't. He, he, all, to him, they were just little spots. But we now have images. And I love Eo because nothing looks like it. It is such a strange looking moon, and it's so colorful. It makes me feel like we got ripped off on our moon, because ours is just really gray. But Io is very colorful, or Eo is very colorful. And that's because it's of all these sulfuric compounds. If you've ever been like to the Yellowstone, the Yellowstone region where there's all these geysers, and you'll see similar colors because of the sulfur. So it probably smell terrible. 
But um, and it, they actually form uh, volcanoes. There's actually volcanism on this little moon. And in fact, it's the most volcanically active world in the solar system. When Voyager 2, there's going into Jupiter's shadow. Uh, when Voyager 2 flew past EO back in the, I think it was around 1980, it found, um, it, it, it found it, I think, nine volcanoes going off simultaneously. So the entire, the entire moon has been completely resurfaced with its own sulfuric magma. And so all those little spots you see there, those are volcanoes. So it's really delightful. And it keeps its same face pointed at Jupiter, just like our moon does. All large moons do that. That's a very energetically favorable configuration. So Io is about the same size as Earth's moon, but uh, far more colorful and far more volcanically active. And that's a lot of fun. So there's the innermost. The next one out that Galileo discovered would be Europa. Again, you can see this in a small telescope. And it is interesting because it has these large scratch marks on uh, one side of it at least, like a big cosmic cat came and just swiped it. But uh, we think those are geysers where the surface is broken apart and, and it's, um, you have geysers of water. And so it's, it's frozen now, it's too, it's too cold to have liquid water, but there might be liquid water below the surface. And those are perhaps places where geysers of water vapor spew up. Uh, we're not sure about that, but that's, that's one possibility. So there's Europa. Uh, it's just a little smaller than EO. And then the next one out, Ganymede. Ganymede's the largest moon in the solar system. It's actually bigger than the planet Mercury. But because it orbits Jupiter, it's orbiting a planet, it's classified as a moon. If you could separate it from Jupiter, it would be its own planet for sure. So Ganymede has a sort of a three-tone color. It's got this bright white for the ejecta of some of the craters, and then a brown, and then a darker brown. And I think it's very pretty. Um, lovely, lovely moon. The largest moon orbiting the largest planet. So it makes that easy to remember. The next moon out, Callisto, is just a little bit smaller, or yeah, a little bit smaller than Ganymede. Probably the second or third largest moon in the solar system. So there it is, pockmarked with these little white craters. Isn't that beautiful? So a lot of beauty in our solar system, especially Jupiter's moons. Very colorful, very, uh, very different. A lot of diversity there. So that's pretty neat. So back to Jupiter. Now the inner moons of Jupiter, they all orbit in the same plane and in the same direction, same direction that Jupiter rotates, that's called prograde. And that's a design feature. There's not a lot of space available there. And so things need to be organized, right? And so having everything orbit the same way keeps things in, in the same plane, keeps things nice and organized. The outer moons have plenty of space available, and so they're not so organized. Now, each one of those is a perfectly good elliptical orbit. It's just there are many, and they have different orientations, and a lot of them orbit backwards. So if you speed up time, you can see they look like a beehive almost. And they're not in the same plane either. If we rotate it sideways, you can see there are all kinds of different orientations. So that's a very common feature. It's a design feature to have the inner ones in the same plane and the outer ones. I mean, it looks crowded, but that's because the lines are thick. There's really a tremendous amount of space available. And all those moons, except the big four, all those are very small. So how many are there? Uh, it's interesting you ask, because they just discovered another like 20 or so. So yeah, so Jupiter, because Saturn was the winner a few months ago. Saturn and Jupiter keep leapfrogging in terms of the number of moons, which has more moons that we know about. And I think Jupiter's up to over 100 now. Not all of them are in this program. This program has the uh, 80 or so that were known at the time I programmed it. Anyway, okay. So that's the Jupiter system. That's fun. And we've sent several spacecraft past Jupiter. One of them was an orbiter, the Galileo spacecraft. Uh, Saturn... The next one out, we've sent several spacecraft past Saturn, and one orbiter, the Cassini spacecraft, went into orbit around Saturn. And everybody loves Saturn, right, because of that beautiful ring system. Let me uh, bring it up there a little bit. Oh, yeah. It's just nothing like Saturn. And it's fun to see it in a small telescope. And I love showing other people Saturn in a small telescope, because it's, just, it's, just, it's one thing to see it on the screen. It's another thing to see it with your eyes. And it's small. You know, it looks like it's about that big, but you can see the rings very clear. And then you people look down the telescope like, are you tricking me? Is that a slide? Because it looks unreal. It just nothing, there's nothing looks like it. But uh, fortunately, the Lord tilted Saturn so we can see those rings. 
Um, if it was edge on, you wouldn't know that they were there because the rings are very thin. Now, it's, now here it's edge on relative to us, but not relative to the sun. So these rings still cast a shadow. But if it were edge on relative to us and the sun, you'd never see the rings. And by the way, in the secular worldview, all the planets should be not tilted. Because if, you know, if the solar system collapsed from a, a cloud like that, conservation of angular momentum ought to keep things spinning in the same way. And so the fact that many planets are tilted, and Saturn's tilted substantially, um, that's, that's something that the Lord did, I think, just to confuse the secularists and, uh, and to declare his glory to us. So isn't that wonderful? Saturn's much like Jupiter. It's a ball of gas, hydrogen, helium. A little smaller, Saturn's nine Earths across. And it's not nearly as massive as Jupiter, so it's a little puffier. And, of course, you have that amazing ring system, uh, trillions of pieces of dust and, and small rocks and pieces of ice that are held. They're basically orbiting Saturn around its equator. And, of course, Saturn has a bunch of moons as well. Saturn has a magnetic field like Jupiter and a very strong one, so you can have aurora on Saturn. And that's an indication that it can't be billions of years old because magnetic fields decay with a time span of thousands of years, uh, not anywhere near millions or billions. Uh, some of the moons of Saturn, there's, it's got a lot. It's got um, around, uh, I don't know, the latest number, 80 or so moons. Uh, Mimas is one of the inner ones that, and this program doesn't show it very well, but there's, there's certain times when there's this massive crater. You can see the crater there, but there's times when the light hits it just right. And it looks just like the Death Star from the Star Wars movies. It's got that big crater there which um, we sometimes humorously call Darth Crater. So it's actually called Herschel, but there you go. So that's one of the inner moons. And it's slightly out of the ring plane, which is neat, because um, if, you, if you were on Mimas, you could actually see the rings then. All the other inner moons are exactly in the ring plane. So if you were to build a base on one of those moons, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see the rings. So that would be kind of depressing. So what else? where else should we go to? How about... Um, How about this one? How about Rhea? I, I, I mean, these ones are a little more what you would typically think of as a moon. They're sort of featureless other than craters. Craters and craters everywhere. Until we get to Titan. That's, is that Titan? No, that's Ipetus. I don't want to go to Ipetus yet. I want to go to Titan first. Let's go to Titan. There's Titan. This is the one that if you have um, a good set of binoculars, you can even see this. You'll see Saturn. You, yes, you can see Saturn's rings in binoculars. They're very small, as you can see them. And there's always this orange star next to Saturn. And that's its largest moon, Titan. The second largest moon in the solar system. Fitting that it orbits the second largest planet. And Titan has that, that orange color because it has a thick atmosphere. It's the only moon that has a thick atmosphere. And it's an atmosphere of hydrocarbons. So hydrocarbons are things like gasoline's a hydrocarbon. So gasoline would be really cheap on, on Titan. But oxygen would be expensive, so count your blessings, because there's no oxygen on Titan, no free oxygen. So there you go. So there's that thick atmosphere. And it, it, for a while, they thought it was the largest moon, because that atmosphere puffs it out a little bit like a cat when they're upset. But um, if you remove that atmosphere, if you remove the clouds, you can see the world is a little bit smaller than Ganymede. So, and, we, and we have used radar to penetrate the surface, so the surface of Titan looks something like that. It has lakes of methane, which is interesting, because methane can't last billions of years, so that was a surprise to the secularists. They thought it should have all have converted to ethane and other stuff. But anyway, pretty neat. So that's Titan. And you can, again, if you have a small telescope, you will always see an orange star around Saturn. That's Titan. But it orbits in the ring plane, so if you're on Titan, you would not see Saturn's rings. They would be edge on. So Ipetus is one that's fun to look at. And when they first discovered Ipetus, they found they could see it when it was on the right side of Saturn, but they couldn't see it when it was on the left side of Saturn. And it took them a while to figure that out. And they eventually did. One side of Ipetus is very dark, the other side is very bright. And so as it's orbiting Saturn, it rotates, keeping the same face pointed towards Saturn. So it's on the right side of Saturn, you see this side covered with basically snow, ice, and then the other side covered with uh, sort of a darker substance. Isn't that wild? Ipetus is really interesting. There's a chain of mountains, too, that goes right along the equator. And uh, that's just, we don't quite know why that is, but it's wonderful. And Ipetus is the innermost moon that orbits not in the ring plane, but at a 
a, a decent angle, so you'd be able to see the rings. So this would be a good place to put a base on Jupiter or, or, or orbiting Saturn to be able to see Saturn and enjoy those lovely rings from a distance. So that's Ipetus. I like that one. So that's the Saturn system. Now, a wonderful thing happened in the 1980s. The planets, all orbiting at their own rates and so on, the planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune lined up in this nice arc. And that allowed us to send one spacecraft past all four, because they would use the gravity of Jupiter to slingshot it onto Saturn, to slingshot it onto Uranus, to slingshot it all onto Neptune. And so the Voyager 2 spacecraft was able to visit all four of the giant planets, thanks to that remarkable act of providence. So this is the way they were lined up when, when uh, Voyager 2 flew past Uranus, which it did in 1986. And it was a clear day on Uranus in 1986. Uranus sometimes has these white clouds that form on it, but there were very few when Voyager 2 flew past. Now the planet Uranus rotates on its side, so it rolls around the sun, which is kind of neat. And that again is perplexing to the secularists, but from a creation point of view, that's not a problem. God can do what he wants. So you're looking at the North Pole or South Pole, depending on how you define it, of the planet Uranus. And it's got a bunch of moons that orbit around it, five relatively large ones, um, Miranda, Ariel, Umbriel, Titania, and Oberon. So here's Miranda, isn't that neat? And it looks like some kind of catastrophe happened on Miranda. You have that weird check mark feature there. So Uranus was discovered by uh, Herschel and uh, it's the first planet that was not known in antiquity. It was, to be, it was discovered in a telescope and he wanted to name it after King George and, and people said, no, you're not naming it after King George. So Uranus, the god of the sky the only Greek god that's used in the planets. All the other ones are named after Roman gods. And the moons are all named after either Shakespearean characters or um, Alexander Pope's The Rape of the Lock. And that was in honor of the fact that it was discovered by an Englishman. So they used the English playwright to name the moons. That's unique to Uranus. So there you go. That's a fun one. And you can see it in the small telescope. In fact, you can see Uranus in binoculars if you know right where to look. And Neptune, likewise. Neptune, Voyager 2, flew past Neptune in 1989. And that was an exciting time because we'd seen all the, the large planets at that point. And Neptune is a slightly smaller version of Uranus. It's a blue ball that, now it's not tilted as much as Uranus. It is tilted. And it has clouds on it, white clouds, water vapor type compounds. The uh, methane is what gives rise to the blue color. And it had a large uh, dark spot on it. We thought Jupiter was the only one until Neptune. And Neptune's is a true cyclone. So it's um, like a hurricane. And sometimes it does, it's, it's not as stable as Jupiter's red spot. Though Jupiter's red spot has been gone for 300 years at least. Uh, Neptune's dark spot comes and goes. And sometimes there's another one that appears in the northern hemisphere of the planet. So it's pretty neat. Now, Neptune, like Jupiter, gives off more energy than it receives from the sun. In fact, it gives off 2.6 times as much energy as it receives from the sun, which is um, 2.6 times as much energy as it receives from the sun. So it, uh, it shouldn't be able to do that for billions of years. It's an indication that it's still warm. A lot of the planets are like that. They give off excess heat, and that indicates they can't be billions of years old. It's like if you took a potato out of the microwave, and you can feel the heat coming off of it, right? But if you come back two hours later, you don't feel the heat coming off of it because it's radiated away all that energy into space. So Jupiter and Neptune have been doing that since creation. They can do that since creation because they're much bigger potatoes, but uh, they can't do it for billions of years. So, and, it, and Neptune has a strong magnetic field, as does Uranus, and uh, that is another indication that they can't be billions of years old. There's a lot of indications of youth in the solar system. It's not, it's not the secular age, it's the biblical age. Uh, Neptune has a number of moons. The one that's most interesting to everyone is Triton, which is the only large moon that orbits its planet backwards. It has a retrograde orbit. And so there it is. And we had a spacecraft, Voyager 2, flew past Triton. It, by the way, the reason it looks kind of blurry on one side is because this thing's rotating as Voyager 2 is flying by. And when it's far away, it sees one side. That's the blurry side because it's low resolution. And then it gets really close to this side. And providentially, there was a lot of interesting activity happening on this side. You see those little black streaks? Those are geysers. 
geysers that, that put up um, soot into a very thin atmosphere of this moon, and they get carried along with the wind, and so they, they, they deposit horizontally. So that was something that the secularists were not expecting, because geysers require internal heat, and a little moon like that should not be able to retain internal heat over 4.5 billion years. So it was really astonishing to the secularists, and we creationists were like, well, yeah, that's kind of what we'd expect. So there you go, although it's neat. So that's Triton, not to be confused with Titan, which orbits Saturn. So that's the Neptune system. And that was it for the planets. I was always disappointed, though, because when I was a kid, Neptune was still, or Pluto was still a planet back when I was a kid. And Pluto is not lined up in that arc, so there was no way to get Voyager 2 past Pluto. Um, but fortunately, the New Horizons spacecraft was launched in 2006. It took nine years to get to Pluto. 2015, we got our first images of Pluto. It's still there. It's not a planet anymore, but it's still really neat. Call it a dwarf planet now. So there it is. There's Pluto. And um, by providence, we got the really cool side when, when New Horizons was close to Pluto. Now, the secularists were expecting that Pluto would be a cold, dead world full of nothing but craters because billions of years old, there's all kinds of objects out there near Pluto that over billions of years they should have impacted its surface. And so they were expecting craters upon craters upon craters and nothing like mountains or valleys because that would require internal heat. And over 4.5 billion years, Pluto shouldn't have any left. And so it was really quite surprising to them that we do find mountains and valleys on Pluto. And there are sections where there are no craters at all. This big heart-shaped feature here, Tomba Regio, the left portion of it, there's not a single crater in there. And that indicates that there's been recent geological activity. And there's that polygonal structure, which we've never seen before, which appears to be um, convection, evidence of convection, heat coming up and mixing up the crust there. So isn't that delightful? And then you can see these mountains over here. They may look like pimples, but those are about as tall as the Rocky Mountains in Colorado, so they're massive. But instead of being made of stone, they're made of ice, water ice. At that distance, ice is as hard as rock because it's so cold. And they're covered with a thin layer of um, methane-type tholines. That, that's what gives it the orange or reddish color that you see. So isn't that neat? And uh, again, you got canyons, and so there's a canyon you can see there. Isn't that wild? So there's, that indicates geological activity on Pluto and not billions of years ago, because it would have been covered up by craters now. Uh, Pluto has five moons. One of them is especially large, and it's called Charon. It's about half the size of Pluto, which isn't much, because Pluto is only two-thirds the size of Earth's moon. But still, relative to its uh, source, that's pretty big. So here's Charon, and it too has mountains and canyons. How about that? It has a dark north pole, which we've never seen before. So that's kind of new and unique. And uh, isn't that interesting? So, and they've started naming, they've given informal names to these things, which may or may not catch on. Whoops. Let's see if I can. I, I think this is kind of fun. Because the, for the first time, they named them after sci fi, which I think is cool. So you got Vulcan Planum, right? You got Kirk Crater, Spock Crater, right? Uhura Crater, Alice, the TARDIS, Chasma, for you, uh, Doctor Who fans. Uh, Leia Organa, Skywalker Crater, and so on. Mordor is the, the name of this region up here, Mordor. So I don't know if those will catch on, but I love it. <laughs> so that's kind of fun. But anyway, it's neat to see these worlds that indicate um, the youth of the solar system, that the, the solar system is the age that God claims it to be, which and he would know he made it. So there you go. So that's the Pluto system. So pretty neat. And again, what a privilege that we live in a time where we've seen these worlds up close thanks to the technology that the Lord has allowed us to develop and to explore these different creations. And they're all beautiful. And, but there is a special beauty to the earth, this planet that God formed to be inhabited. And that, that makes sense because, um, you know, it, it, the, one of the astronauts who walked on the moon, Jim Irwin, he later became a Christian, a very devout Christian. And he said something to the effect of, the amazing thing is not that man walked on the moon, but that God walked on the earth. And I think that's appropriate. This is the planet where God himself became a man and walked and, and paid the penalty for our sins by dying on the cross. I think that's amazing. So it's, um, we have a rare privilege of being made in God's image, something that as far as we know, that's, that's unique to humanity. 
and that God purchased us by his own blood, and it was on this, this little uh, blue marble right here. So it just gives you a sense of the awesomeness of God and the compassion of God to come and care for creatures such as ourselves, which are so tiny compared to the rest of the universe. So let me again remind you of some of the um, resources that we have. We have this presentation, actually, uh, Worlds of Creation. We have that on DVD. Now, I never do it exactly the same way twice, so you'll get different information on that, but a lot of it will be the same. So uh, Astronomy Reveals Creation is another talk I do on this along similar lines, showing how the universe declares God's glory and not the billions of years. So we have that on DVD as well. Uh, the books, Taking Back Astronomy, uh, cover some of the information I covered today and some that I covered in the other talk. I've been told that I talk too fast sometimes, so I wrote the book really slowly. You can take your time with it. Yeah. Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, How to Better Enjoy the Night Sky from a Christian Perspective. And so that's a fun one. Physics of Einstein, if you've ever wondered about black holes and is time travel possible and stuff like that. Truth is stranger than fiction. And that's uh, written for laymen, although there are in-depth boxes for students who want to go into, they say, I'd like to know mathematically how that works. Um, you can do that, or you can skip those and still get the, the main thrust of what, what it was that Einstein discovered and how that applies to creation, how it solves, for example, the distant starlight issue. The secret code of creation shows you how God has built beauty into uh, an aspect of creation you probably never even thought about. It's wonderful, and that's just a fun one. And we have that on Blu-ray, too, because it's very, very pretty. So if you have a Blu-ray player, get that version. And we have a book now called Fractals, The Secret Code of Creation. I can't remember if we had this one the last time I was here. So this may be new. If not, the hardcover is definitely new. And that comes with software that will allow you to explore these shapes as well. So that's a fun resource. Don't forget you can get the books together for discount, the DVDs together for 20% discount, or the library pack for a 30% discount, and have an immediate creation library at your disposal. Don't forget to sign up for a free monthly newsletter. It comes out. Around the 15th of the month, I, uh, we did this one a little early because I wanted to tell people about the eclipse, but normally around the 15th, just make sure you put your email address in legibly or you'll get nothing. And then do check us out on the web as well, Biblical Science Institute. Uh, go buy some books and also step outside and see the eclipse. I'll have some equipment out there that you can uh, borrow. I don't have a lot, lot for everybody. We'll have to share. But uh, if you want to see the annual eclipse, now would be a good time. It's going to max out in the next 20 minutes or so will be the the best time to look at it. So buy some books, then come look at the eclipse. All right. Thanks. God bless.